Our final event today will be an insider's look at the Permanent Court of Arbitration and its rules. Our speakers are Evgenia Gorocheva and Miriam Chohan. Evgenia currently acts as Senior Legal Counsel at the PCA, and Miriam previously worked as Assistant Legal Counsel at the PCA, and then worked for several years at the Iran United States Claims Tribunal. Please feel free to type any questions you may have for our two speakers in the Q&A or the chat, and we will answer them at the end of their discussion. With that said, I'm going to turn things over to our speakers, Evgenia and Miriam. Raven, thanks very much. Um, well, thank you to um, everyone who has joined this afternoon for you, this evening for Mariam and I, where we are located. Um, I know for those who have participated in the mood rounds, you must all be but perhaps relieved, but also exhausted. Um, so although the title of is an insider's look at the PCA and its rules, we've decided to take it quite lightly on the rules part and not get very technical and just give you uh, a sense of the work of the PCA. Of course, the mood problem has um, a little bit of an insight. You have some letters uh, in the mood problem um, that um, reflect, I would say, quite nicely, quite accurately, uh, what letters at the beginning of a, of a case might look like coming from the PCA, um, acknowledging receipt of a notice, uh, noting the appointment of arbitrators, reminding everyone involved what the deadlines are for um, arbitrator appointments. Um, and, and, and really, it's very, very accurate because even the, the formatting is on point, um, follows PCA practice. Um, but this type of case that you have in the mood is um, just a small part of what the PCA does. And so we were hoping today to give you a bit more of a broader overview and also a more practical overview, just to give you a sense of what it might be like uh, to actually work at the PCA. And Mariam will speak mo more to that um, in a bit. I'm going to share my screen with a few slides, um, mostly to enliven our presentation, our discussion a bit um, with some photos. Um, but, Please, as Raven said, do um, do send us questions in the chat. Um, that way we can make sure that we're actually um, using this time usefully uh, for you. Um, and so let me just jump right into my introduction on the PCA, the oldest intergovernmental organization for the peaceful resolution of disputes between states. Um, and this means that we have to take a little bit of a historical excursus to uh, talk about uh, the role of the PCA. Uh, it was long established that arbitration was a good means for the resolution of disputes between states, um, going back as far as I think if you, you know, if you read Thucydides, he will tell you that uh, Athens and Sparta had arbitration agreements. Um, but more to our point, uh, in 1899, uh, drawing on this tradition, uh, this gentleman that you see on the slide, uh, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, called a peace conference, which took place in The Hague in 1899 um, and was attended by 22 states. And the purpose of it was to seek the most objective means of ensuring to all peoples the benefits of a real and lasting peace, lofty as that sounds, and basically to put a stop to the race to armaments that was going on at the time between the uh, larger powers of the world. Um, at the time, they discussed the crea potential creation of a world court, so the idea of a court that would have jurisdiction over states. Uh, but this did not happen. What did happen is that they um, adopted a convention, the Convention for the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes. And this convention recognized arbitration specifically as the most effective and equitable means of settling legal disputes where diplomacy had failed between states. 
And this convention defined some key features of arbitration with which you will of course be very, very familiar, but it was very important at the time that it, these were clearly set out um, in the convention. So the fact that the parties would have to consent in order for arbitration to happen, that this would involve judges of their own choice. So this idea of appointing your own decision maker, um, that this would be on the basis of respect for law, contrasting this with any kind of um, good offices or mediation conciliation type of proceeding. And that the procedures would be flexible. So this would be a little bit different from the court. And this very same convention is what established the permanent court of arbitration. The idea being that the tribunals might be different from case to case, but there would be a permanent secretariat behind the scenes that would support the work of these ephemeral tribunals and would keep um, an institutional memory of cases so that the, the proceedings could be more, more effective, essentially. So going from there, fast forward to today, very quickly. Um, now the PCA provides uh, registry services at about, at one time, 170 cases. Um, the reason for these large numbers uh, is that Although initially the only cases the PCA worked on were interstate, um, the mandate has since been expanded uh, to include what we call mixed arbitrations. So basically the moot problem, arbitrations between um, a private party on the one side and a public entity on the other side. Um, the, and, the, and this is what has really opened up uh, the work of the PCA. Um, the PCA is comprised of three different parts, uh, which you see here, the admin council, the members of the court and the international bureau, which I will go through uh, one by one, just to give you an idea. So since the PCA is an intergovernmental organization, today it has 122 contracting parties compared to the 22 when it was created. Um, these meet only a few times a year, uh, and but they basically set out the policy uh, of the organization. This is the body that uh, at the relevant time decided that it was part of the BCA's mandate to, uh, over, to administer mixed disputes as well. Um, it decides on our budget, and that's essentially it. Then there are the members of the court. Uh, each contracting party has the possibility of nominating under, and this is pursuant to the founding convention of the PCA, for people of known competency in international law of the highest moral reputation and disposed to accept the duties of arbitrators. So this creates essentially a list um, of, arbit of potential arbitrators that are suggested by the countries. Um, who can be appointed as arbitrators, but don't have to be. So this is an entirely optional list and um, in a case administered by the PCA, both the parties and the PCA itself can appoint just about anyone. The four people you see on the screen who may be familiar to some of you uh, are the four Canadian uh, nominees at the moment. And then in all of that, um, so you may be asking yourself what it is that we do. Well, the policy of the organization is set out by the administrative council, but the day-to-day -day work is done by what we call the International Bureau, uh, of which I am a member, of which Mariam was a member um, back when she was with us. Uh, so what you see on the slide, this is, I mean, in total, we are maybe um, 70 legal and admin staff uh, of a very diverse geographical backgrounds who speak many languages. Uh, and what you're looking at is some of us at our weekly meeting on Zoom in the way that they were these meetings were held during the pandemic. Um, and so these are the people who will, as I said, do the day-to-day -day work of the organization, which very briefly, will cover our appointing authority services, meaning that um, 
uh, work on appointing arbitrators, deciding challenges to arbitrators. Uh, in the mood problem, this is a part of the arbitration that it went quite smoothly. Uh, each party appointed its own arbitrator who were able to agree on a presiding arbitrator. But it doesn't always go that smoothly. And this is when uh, often we come in and we, at the very start of the case, will need to analyze it, decide whether... Um, at first glance, there is an arbitration agreement, uh, reflect on the ideal profile for the decision maker in the case, uh, and then hunt for candidates and make an appointment. Then probably most of our time is spent on the registry services, which is essentially to provide support to the tribunals and the parties in the cases, which can be arbitrations, but can also be other kinds of dispute resolution proceedings, various expert procedures, um, conciliation commissions, and the like. And then there's also a um, another side to the work, which is to assist uh, our contracting parties with capacity building, uh, with training and education, participate in conferences, publications. And finally, uh, a more diplomacy-oriented side, I would say, which is to assist our contracting parties by providing them information outside the dispute context and in so by working in support of the work of the administrative council. So this is a very general overview. Um, but to illustrate it a bit, I've brought some photos. Um, this is the Peace Palace the, this in The Hague. Um, these are the headquarters of the PCA. Um, the little red rectangle is um, what was my office until five months ago. Um, so basically, the day of any member of the International Bureau uh, who is working from the headquarters would basically look like this. Uh, walking up one of these two lanes uh, up to the palace. Uh, one of the things, of course, that we will do in support of arbitrations is organize uh, hearings. And this is a hearing in... Um, uh, it's taking place in the Great Hall of Justice in the Peace Palace, uh, which is also the room where the International Court of Justice sits. This is um, a proceeding in the Abbey case, uh, which concerned the delimitation um, of a contested area um, between, well, that sort of lies uh, at the border of what is today Sudan and South Sudan. Um, and this was a case that was part of the lengthy peace process uh, where there was going to be the referendum on the independence of South Sudan and this particular region, which is rich in petroleum, would get to have its own referendum to decide uh, whether it wished to, which, which side of the country, of, of the former Sudan, it wished to join. Um, this particular, this is the biggest room for hearings in the palace and um, this particular hearing was held there because it was open to the public. So, as you see, there, there are quite a few people attending, and it was actually also broadcast online so that people could follow uh, the, the, this public proceeding. Uh, here's another example um, in another uh, room of the Peace Palace, which is our administrative council room, but also uh, informally known as the Japanese room because, uh, well, as you see, it's decorated with this uh, really beautiful tapestry. Uh, and as one example of uh, what a tradition we have at the palace, which is that the contracting parties uh, usually uh, offer gifts to the, to the institution. This is a, um, a hearing in the Indus Waters Kishinganga case, which took place in 2011, 2013 about uh, between India and Pakistan, a case under a very important treaty about water rights in the Indus Basin. Um, at the front of the room, you see the, this case had a, a quite unusually a seven member arbitral tribunal, which is what the treaty requires and uh, comprised of six lawyers and also one hydrologist. 
So using that flexibility of arbitration to uh, have the decision makers who have the right expertise. And then on the sides of the tribunal at the front are the members of the PCA of the registry for the case. Uh, and on the right side, the little circle in blue, the tiny, tiny circle, that was me in my first, I think, year at the PCA, uh, back when I was there as a McGill fellow uh, funded partly by McGill University and partly by uh, the Quebec government. And here are some of our university fellows uh, at work on uh, other tasks um, that are not related to cases. Uh, on the left-hand side, they're at attending UN climate talks. Uh, in the middle, the PCA's India conference, and uh, on the right, working on some publications related to business and human rights. Aside from uh, our uh, headquarters in The Hague, the PCA also has a global presence, in particular with five uh, international offices. As I said, until five months ago, I wasn't that uh, office in the Peace Palace, but now I'm in the, in the Vienna office of the PCA, which actually means that in a month's time, I very much hope that we will get to welcome some of you uh, for the moot. Uh, and now I'll, um, I'll go quickly over um, some of our case activities, just to give you a flavor, both of the types of cases that we administer, but also of the role of the PCA in these cases. Uh, before jumping into that, um, I guess it's important to say that most PCA cases will have involved in them at least one state or state-owned or controlled entity which is of course the case for the mood problem, and which means that the mood problem this year had certain or raised certain issues that we see a lot in our work and that are very specific to the involvement of a state entity. Uh, for example, the whole discussion of um, the policy concerns that were raised in Equatoriana about um, arbitration in general, and as a result of which the uh, contract was not submitted for ratification to parliament. Uh, the very argument that uh, under domestic law, there are specific rules as a result of which an arbitration agreement is invalid. Um, the arguments surrounding the idea that the contract was entered into uh, through corruption and the interaction between the criminal prosecution in this at the national level and the international arbitral proceedings. All of this we see quite a lot precisely because uh, states and state entities are involved. And with that, I'll just take one pause to say, Mariam, if you see questions in the chat, chime in because I, while I'm showing the, um, the slides, I can't easily see the chat. Um, and so to go through a few examples, um, interstate cases, uh, I'm not going to go into great detail. This is mostly to illustrate the PC role, but here what you see is um, that Kishinganga Indus Waters arbitration that I just men mentioned uh, when I showed you the Japanese room. So what you see here is the dam and hydroelectric powerhouse that were being built on a river that um, straddles the um, part of Azad Jammu and Kashmir over which Pakistan uh, claims sovereignty and over which, and that over which, or rather it straddles the line of, con of factual control in an area over which both Pakistan and India uh, claim sovereignty. So very sensitive area. Um, and the case had to do with whether the specifications of this hydroelectric power project uh, were in accordance with the Indus Water Treaty. One among the very many things the registry did in this case, uh, which included organizing the hearing you saw earlier, was also to work on organizing two site visits to this uh, very sensitive area of the world. Two, because uh, the court needed to examine 
the river, both in the dry and the wet seasons. Um, and this involved obviously um, just preparing the site visit, coordinating between the parties, um, collecting, um, well, documenting the site visit for future reference, organizing things like insurance, etc. cetera. Uh, so what you see here is really the registry at work. In the middle picture, where you see two, um, uh, two presidents of the International Court of Justice at different times, uh, Judge Stephen Schwebel and Judge Peter Tomka, along with uh, three um, members of the PCA staff whom you can readily recognize mostly by their cameras because they were busy, as I said, documenting the site visit. Um, then moving on to the mixed arbitrations that we administer. Um, this is the, um, well, as I said, the mandate of the BCA initially only included interstate disputes and it was opened up in 1934 with this particular case, um, Radio Corporation of America versus China. Um, and but I won't go into any detail because this is exactly the kind of case under the mood problem. And I did see that there was a, a question in our uh, in our chat about um, precisely the um, immunities provision uh, of the PC rules. And I'm actually this is probably a good time to to address that, I suppose. Um, if I recall correctly, and I'm, or rather, let me, um, yeah, let me get back to this in just in a moment because I'll I'll first take a look at the exact provision to make sure that I, I address this properly. Um, um, yeah. So continuing with the other types of. Um, Um, yeah, sorry, apologies. Um, yeah. So the other types of mixed arbitration, so the one you had was one under a contract, but quite a lot of what we do are arbitrations between uh, foreign investors and states, and those, not always, but very largely arise under investment treaties, so they're, tr uh, they're treaty cases. Um, again, without going into any of the detail, I'll take one example. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Um, this is one case, the Yugos arbitration, which you can look into, famous for uh, the largest damages award in, in investment arbitration to date. Uh, but I, I, I wanted to use um, this one uh, because just to illustrate a few of the um, aspects of the PCA's role, I suppose. Um, in this case, uh, the PCA Secretary General was acting as appointing authority. He appointed the chairman, Yves Fortier, whom Raven mentioned earlier, um, very, very eminent uh, Canadian lawyer. Um, the PCA Secretary General also resolved a number of challenges on grounds of lack of impartiality and independence to arbitrators. Uh, this is, uh, the, the PCA managed the archive as it usually does for every case. Uh, in this particular case, it was uh, not a simple endeavor. This is an extract from the award, basically um, remind, noting toward the bottom there that the written submissions of the party spanned more than 4,000 pages and the transcripts more than 2,000, two and a half thousand, and that there were nearly 9,000 exhibits to have been filed with the tribunal. So this is the archive that um, the PCA kept and managed uh, and helped the tribunal find documents in over the nearly um, uh, 
quite the long duration of the case, nearly 10 years. Um, one other thing that we are able to organize is the safe passage of witnesses uh, under the headquarters agreement with the Netherlands, uh, where the Netherlands agrees to grant certain privileges and immunities to witnesses who participate in PCA proceedings. And so in particular, in this case, one witness who had a, an international um, uh, arrest warrant issued against him was able to travel to The Hague to testify without having to be concerned about being arrested um, as a result of, of this arrangement with the Netherlands. Another um, quite big part of the work is to manage deposits uh, to pay for the costs of arbitration. Uh, in this case, here you see the varying, well, the very large cost of this very huge arbitration. Um, and at the bottom, you can see about 9 million in tribunal fees and expenses, and then the fees and expenses of the tribunal assistant and the PCA. So those, those th last three items are the funds that would have been received by the PCA from the parties while the case was going on um, and disbursed uh, along the way to cover these costs. Um, this is another example. As I said, the PCA can help in assisting site visits. Um, this is a photo from a, an investor state arbitration. And what you're seeing is the court reporter in the Amazon, um, basically uh, creating a, uh, uh, a transcript uh, of the site visit under the rain and being thankfully very flexible uh, in the way that he did his work. And then wrapping up, um, in addition to the interstate cases and the mixed arbitrations, there are evolving types of arbitrations that, are admin that we administer. Um, for example, we're able to administer arbitrations between um, private parties that are in the field of um, in uh, essentially environmental law and climate change. Um, and this photo refers to another example. Um, in 2013, this factory in Bangladesh had collapsed uh, with very um, heavy loss of life um, and many injuries. And this tragedy had led uh, the trade, well, there was a public outcry and eventually it led to these accords uh, under which trade unions and brands agreed to improve safety measures uh, in the garment industry in Bangladesh, but also agreed to arbitra arbitration provisions um, in certain cases. And the very first arbitration under those accords was administered by the PCA. Um, and um, so finally, just um, for those of you who might be more or less recent alumni of universities and might be interested in opportunities um, at the PCA, we have um, three month internships and one year fellowships. Um, both of these are unpaid or uh, more often uh, than not. Um, financed through different um, uh, educational institutions, um, but are basically jobs in which um, a young lawyer can come into the organization, basically take part in all of the work uh, that we do from arbitral appointments to case administration, et cetera. Um, and this is something that I did for a year, many years ago. This is something that Mariam did as well. Um, and uh, that can lead to um, sometimes more permanent positions within the organization, but more often also leads to good opportunities outside of the PCA at other, um, other international organizations. Uh, many of our uh, former fellows have gone on to join uh, the biggest arbitration outfits um, across the world. Um, and um, 
some like Mariam have gone on to join the Iran US Claims Tribunal, which is um, a good place for me to stop and let Mariam perhaps talk to you a little bit more about the practical side of working as a fellow um, for the PCA, a time I will take to take a quick look at those provisions of uh, the PC rules about which there are questions, uh, so I can address that afterwards. Thank you, Evgenia, um, and thank you to Arbitration Place and uh, Raven and Barry for inviting me. Um, Evgenia gave a very thorough presentation with excellent photos. Um, I won't try and, uh, and compete with that. I'll just um, speak briefly about my own experience. Um, I actually did the VIS a number of years ago, and it was an excellent opportunity um, and a really unique experience. So I wish you all best of luck um, in Vienna and any other pre moots you might try uh, to squeeze in before then. Um, so I'll just speak briefly about my experience and then provide a bit more information on the fellowships and internships at the PCA and tips for anyone who's interested in working at some of the other um, institutions in The Hague. And uh, right, so. I graduated from McGill's BCL JD program and received the fellowship uh, to work as an assistant legal counsel at the PCA in 2018. Um, and then a year later, I worked at the Iran United States Claims Tribunal, where I was legal advisor to Judge Rosemary Barquette. Um, and one of the reasons why I was really interested in The Hague and the PCA in particular at the outset is because I had worked with international arbitration law firms in London and Paris in my 2L and 3L summers in law school. And I found that line of work really interesting and I wanted to, to sort of continue in the field and, and to see what it was like working at organizations. Um, and I do think, especially given the, the, the background that Evgenia provided, you get a really good, well-rounded understanding of how international dispute resolution works. Um, and I think it's a very important experience that if you're able to, if you're presented with the opportunity to really take advantage of it, to have a full understanding of how these bigger disputes, not just investor state, but also the interstate disputes, um, the different sorts of claims commissions, for example, um, are, are administered and um, how these decisions actually come about. I think that's a, a really important understanding to have. Um, so I'll just go over really briefly some of my biggest takeaways from my time there. So first, um, of course, the work is really interesting. Evgenia talked uh, about the, the state element, and of course, that's the, the subject of the, the Vismut this year. Um, and the PCA does a lot more than that as well. They not only administer these cases, but they also provide um, a lot of assistance, capacity building, um, as well as publications, which I think are really interesting. And if you have the opportunity to work at the Peace Palace, um, and I'm sure the other offices as well, there's a trove of resources and, and information there, um, especially at uh, the Peace Palace itself. You have the Peace Palace Library, uh, which is a really unique place where, where you can find a lot of things that you can't necessarily find online. Um, and as an ALC, as an assistant legal counsel, you're able to work with some of the brightest legal minds in the field, um, assisting tribunals and uh, corresponding with parties and arbitrators um, to the extent necessary. And uh, second, I think um, is equally as important sort of wherever you end up working, it's the people who you work with. And I did find at the PCA, everyone from the case managers, the IT staff, the interns, the ALCs, everyone to the top is excellent, um, not only in what they do, but also how everyone works together. Evgenia mentioned that people are coming together really from all over the world, um, many different legal traditions, different cultures and languages, and it's truly an interesting place to be um, and filled with excellent people, many of whom are still my friends today. Um, and it also provides a great opportunity for mentorship. The PCA has um, taken the time to sort of uh, pair new ALCs with legal counsel, senior legal counsel as mentors to provide them guidance and um, sort of direct them during their time at the PCA. Um, and even aside from those given mentors, I found that everyone I worked with was really, um, they really took the time to, to speak with ALCs and to give them a lot of information and, and sort of help them out. Um, so it was really 
good in that sense. And of course, if you've ever had the chance to visit the Peace Palace, it's a very awe-inspiring place to be. You saw the photos that Evgenia shared, um, especially at the start of your career. It's a very, it, it's just awe-inspiring. It's a building so rich with uh, history and beauty and The Hague is a fantastic place to live. Um, so if if you're interested in international law, of course, it's, it, it, it's an ideal place to be. Um, and in general, I found working at international institutions, um, at the Iran-US Claims Tribunal in particular, it really gives you an excellent opportunity to hone your reading and writing skills. Uh, more often than not, you're working with people for whom English is not necessarily their first language, even though everyone is perhaps drafting or, or speaking, presenting in English. Uh, and especially coming from different legal traditions, it really helps you to understand your own um, your own thoughts and and better ways in which to to communicate with them. So it's it's an excellent opportunity for that. And I know for um, fellow Canadian students who might be listening, uh, I was going through the lawyer licensing process when I was uh, an ALC at the PCA, and I was able to do international articles uh, there. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but when I was doing that, that was possible, and I thought that was a really Cool and unique opportunity to be able to do the fellowship and also still be um, admitted to the bar in, in Ontario when I when I finished. Um, and if anyone has any questions about that or sort of what the process was like, I'd be more than happy to, to chat. Uh, and then the fellowships that were mentioned, um, as Evgenia said, they're one year in duration, usually for recent graduates. I know for Mikhail, I think it's about up to three years after you graduate, you can apply to work um, as an ALC in The Hague. And I believe now there is also an option for the offices in Mauritius and Buenos Aires. Um, and the participating universities, of course, it, it depends. I think traditionally it was um, McGill, Yale, um, MIDS, and, and some others around the world. Uh, and of course the internships are a bit shorter in duration. And I think the PCA offers internships within the International Bureau, but also ICA, the International Council for Commercial Arbitration, um, and all of the information on the deadlines and the requirements are on the website, uh, the PCA website. And there are, of course, other opportunities in The Hague, um, as Evgenia mentioned, uh, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal, where I worked for the last three years, it's a smaller institution. So it's just nine judges and 10 legal advisors uh, there are no interns because of the, the smaller nature. You really work one-on-one -on -one with the judge um, uh, for which you work. And that pertains really to resolving the interstate disputes between Iran and the United States stemming from uh, 1979. And then you have the ICJ, which is, of course, uh, a much bigger institution and I think there are more opportunities there for fellows as well. They have partnerships with universities and also internships of a shorter duration. And then if you're interested in criminal law, there's um, the ICC, the International Residual Mechanism uh, for Criminal Tribunals, which I believe is wrapping up the work of the ICTY and the ICTR. Um, and the STL, there's a lot of acronyms when you're working in The Hague. Um, the STL is the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, and I believe, I'm not sure if they are still operating, I know they had some funding issues, but they also take in interns and legal officers. Um, so that's sort of an overview of um, working as a fellow at the PCA and um, other opportunities in The Hague, and if anyone has any questions about working um, in The Hague or or at either of those institutions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer articling in, in Ontario abroad. Um, just let me know. Thanks, Mariam. And while we have a lull, I'll, um, I'll take the opportunity to address the, the two questions we had in the chat. Um, but while I do that, if anyone has any further questions for today's session, now's the time, basically. Um, there was a question about the provision of the PC rules that addresses sovereign immunities. Um, well, it's, if you want to specify um, what your question is about, then of course I can I can be a bit more specific. But essentially, um, 
the, the rules provide that the agreement to arbitrate under the rules should be understood as a waiver of an immunity to jurisdiction in cases between a state and a private party. So this refers to the fact that obviously an arbitration clause um, is an agreement of the state to submit to the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, but it also go, is a bit broader in that it um, is also a waiver of immunity uh, from submission to the jurisdiction of national courts insofar as they relate to the arbitration. So for example, for annulment proceedings or related um, or, 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 or any kind of proceedings um, in, um, in support of uh, the arbitration, say for interim measures or uh, in order to produce documents or anything like that. Um, and at the same time, the, the same provision of the BC rules stipulates that the agreement to arbitrate should not be understood as a waiver of immunity uh, from execution. So this is to be clear that it does not waive any of you the immunities that the state may have uh, in respect of its assets. So although the case may be fully decided both in the um, in, in the arbitral proceeding and in any uh, related court proceedings, um, when the time comes to execute against assets of the state, um, the arbitration agreement no longer has the effect of any kind of waiver. Um, this reflects a position that is usually accepted to be the case in any event, but it was felt necessary to make this very clear in the rules. And one particularity that you can note is that this is only really from what I was calling earlier mixed arbitrations, because in an interstate arbitration, um, the agreement to arbitrate obviously is a submission to the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, but should not necessarily be understood as a submission to the jurisdiction of any national court, uh, nevertheless. And then what did we have? We had a question about whether the PC rules are in addition to other PC rules. Well, there are older sets of PCA um, arbitration rules, uh, mainly adopted in the 1990s, um, which were focused on specific uh, types of parties being involved. So there is there are rules for cases between states, and there are rules for cases between an international organization in the state and, and as a state and a private party and so on. Um, and those were, in a sense, consolidated under the 2012 rules. Um, so in a way today, there's no need largely to look back to the PCA's older rules. The, the, the 2012 rules stand on their own. Um, the main reason that the older rules still get um, invoked is that sometimes, um, well, basically it's helpful to have the reference to the relevant parties in the title, and because those rules may have already been uh, specifically referred to in a contract or treaty, in which case they, we come back to them. But going forward, we generally recommend the use of the 2012 rules because they, they take into account uh, many more years of arbitral practice and solve procedural problems with, that were not yet addressed in the older rules. And then, um, well, the, the, the third question that we were being asked is if there are any unique aspects of the PCA rules that might be particularly relevant to the mood problem. And I would actually say probably not. Um, as, as I mentioned, I think there are aspects of the moot problem that um, are particular to the involvement of states, but none of this is so much at the procedural level. Um, so, I mean, the main procedural question, as you know, under the under the moot problem is about bifurcation, and that one. Um, the rules are relevant to Article 17 in particular, but that article is, I think, quite consistent with um, the practice under most arbitral rules, so it's not unique to the rules, I would say. Um, 
because of course um actually the rules seek to be a very modern set of arbitration rules that are, are just provide for a fair and efficient process that address those problems that are known um and they differ from other sets of rules only in, in a few key respects one of them was addressing sovereign immunities one is under the applicable law section where it it, it states what the applicable law might be depending on what who the parties are um and a few other key provisions along the way um but they're not they're, they're not completely different from what you would the kinds of procedural rules you might see in a purely commercial arbitration for example um, so that addresses these questions and um I think there's one more question we just got, which, which is... I think it's very broad, to be <laughs> honest. Um, how does the function of PCA differ from that of ICSID? Um, well, yes, um, this is clearly, clearly, clearly much, much too broad, probably, to address. Um, but um, I think just the main... Uh, um, the main the main the main thing to say is that uh exit cases proceed either under the exit convention or the additional facility rules whereas for pca cases there's a lot more flexibility they can be under the pca rules they can be under various types of ad hoc rules including uncitral rules but they but they but we administer cases under um essentially tailor-made uh provisions and contracts um or treaties um, so there's a lot of variety in the way that a, a PCA case might actually proceed. And let, one more question, which perhaps given the time will be our final question, I guess, um, being whether 11 years for the 2012 rules is actually quite a, a long time and whether we're looking to update those rules. Um, well, I would say the... the the PC rules follow largely, as I was saying, other sets of rules that, that exist out there. And in particular, they're based on the UNCITRAL rules, the rules of the UN Commission for Trade for International Trade Law. Um, and that set of rules still remains in its 2010 iteration and functions quite well. I mean, the, the vast majority of our cases are under either the PCA or the ancestral rules, and they don't have any major gaps. So in that sense, I think the rules are quite um, modern still. Um, but at the same time, we are actually working on some optional protocols that might be used together with the PCA rules, which will not be an amendment to them, but will be uh, will provide some additional um, options, uh, in particular in the areas of emergency arbitration, of expedited arbitration, uh, of scrutiny of awards, uh, and early dismissal of claims. So these are the four areas where um, there's been quite a lot of development, which is around these additional procedures, let's say. Um, but we don't see them as a need for a uh, an update to the rules so much as a need to give some other procedural options to parties so that the, when they draft their uh, arbitration clauses, they can look at whether they might have a need for emergency arbitration or expedited arbitration, for example. Um, oh, and I see, I see Barry has also sent us a question for, well, um, the role of the PCA as appointing authority, another quite broad topic. Um, but yes, essentially, beyond um, beyond the mandate related to cases that involve states, the PCA has a mandate specifically under the UNCITRAL rules, as well as under some other instruments, under some national laws, uh, under the PCA rules, etc., um, as the appointing authority, which means that we we do this work in a much broader um, variety of cases, including purely commercial ones between private parties. Um, 
And this consists of um, having parties come to us where uh, assistance is needed with the appointment of a tribunal, for example, because a respondent has not um, made its own appointment or because two core arbitrators are not able to agree on a presiding arbitrator. Um, and to, to, to make those appointments. Um, as I was saying earlier, this for us generally just means having to examine the case and imagine the profile of the perfect arbitrator that uh, we would like to see, um, having regard to the types of parties involved, the amount in dispute, the where the parties are from geographically, uh, what kind of applicable law there is, so what kind of expertise in, in terms of law beyond uh, international law might be needed. Um, and so to, to, to come up with a profile and then basically try to find the person who fits that profile. And in addition, I have to say that in, in the last few years, there's been quite a large push to also increase the diversity of appointments, uh, both in terms of geographic representation but, and, and gender. Um, and the other side of this medal is that um, beyond the appointments, uh, the PCA Secretary General will also often be deciding on challenges to arbitrators. So when a party wishes to remove an arbitrator claiming that they are not independent or not impartial. Um, and this is something that will be done if the parties requested with a reasoned decision, um, building on both um, publicly available case law, uh, but also our internal case law. Um, and I think, that um, we're exactly at our hour, actually. Um, I did cut into your time a bit with the opening remarks. If you do want to take just this one last question that came in, um, it's um, completely up to you. Um, right. Well, I, this is going to be an easy one because I'm not sure what what is the case being referred to actually? Um, so I would have some difficulty answering. Um, so um, on that note, I'd like to thank you, Raven, for inviting us to participate and um, all of your colleagues for making this possible as well. Thank you and thank you both for your time, your support of our pre moot and most importantly, for such an insightful discussion. Um, and to all of us who are joining us virtually, thank you for attending our pre moot this weekend and to the mooters on the call still, best of luck in Vienna. We look forward to seeing you in Vienna, indeed. Thank you so much again, you too, and take care and enjoy the rest of your day or night or morning, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world right now. Thank you. Have a good Thanks. night. Take care.